I'm a professor of otolaryngology at the National University of Singapore and a professor of public health and preventive medicine at Oregon Health and Science University. So, but my residence is in Singapore. I live in Singapore. Um, I'm just still involved with projects back in Oregon as well. And um, I, I'm the director of uh, the graduate training program in audiology. And I also see patients at the National University of Hospital, specifically people with uh, tinnitus, with sound tolerance disorders, and any other kind of strange hearing issues that, that may happen. I've been involved in tinnitus research since about 1986 uh, in every capacity you can imagine. Uh, clinical trials, electrophysiological measures of brain activity, tinnitus severity, factors that affect tinnitus, uh, uh, lots of lots of different things. Right now, um, uh, actually, in, in tinnitus prevention, preventing tinnitus through through reducing noise exposures, uh, especially in kids. Right now, I, I'm primarily involved with tinnitus and sound tolerance problems as a as a clinician. Uh, uh, we have a tinnitus clinic at the National University of Hospital, and one day a week, um, I go and. Uh, I, I get all the patients that nobody else wants, the ones that, you know, the, the most desperate, the most severe, the, the most troubled. Uh, and uh, those are the people that I, I really enjoy working with because there's so much that can be done if, if you're willing to just take time with each individual and figure out what they need. One of the things for, for people with very severe tinnitus um, is, is that there are many factors, many different things that affect tinnitus severity. By severity, I mean the impact on the individual's life, not just the sound that they hear. You know, I, I hear a ringing sound, I hear crickets, or it's really loud or not so loud, but, but uh, the negative impact, the impact on their sleep, the impact on their ability to concentrate, uh, the frustration they experience, the hopelessness, the stress and strain on their family, their work relationships, uh, all of these things. And, and uh, we find that that it's not just the sound itself that causes the problem. It's, 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 it's many other things. So if a person uh, is, is having depression as a result of their tinnitus, they may have a thyroid condition that's feeding into that. Uh, if a person has tinnitus uh, uh, due to a degenerative cervical uh, vertebrae disease, uh, if we can resolve the neck issue, we can give them relief from their tinnitus. If a person has reactive tinnitus and we find, uh, we look for an autoimmune condition. So, so the issue is, is really looking at the entire person, all of the things going on in their life and finding the ones that are impacting the tinnitus, resolving them as much as possible, and then using sound and acoustic therapy to, to help the brain push the tinnitus back as far back in the background as it can. Tinnitus care in Asia is, is is really at its early stages. There are small pockets, very, very small pockets of interest and expertise. Um, but for the most part, hearing healthcare across all of Asia is, is very neglected. Uh, Southeast Asia, Asia Pacific region, according to the World Health Organization, has the highest incidence of hearing loss of any other region on earth. And yet we probably have fewer resources as well. And uh, when we came to Singapore, we found that, that uh, the, there are very little going on in Singapore. You think of Singapore as an advanced place, highly developed, and in, in many ways it is. It's, it's, a, it's a great place to be, to live. Uh, but hearing health was at a very low level and tinnitus care was almost non-existent. Uh, we had to deal with, with just getting the hospitals and the clinics to understand that we could do something, getting the physicians to, to, to recognize that that even though they couldn't identify an active disease process that needed to be treated medically or surgically, even if they couldn't find it, there were still many, many things we could do to help the patients. Um, and, um, and so as we began to educate the care providers and administrators, uh, uh, they began to support it and, and find interest. The collaboration between clinical world and research world, it, it always goes back and forth. You have to. Uh, in the clinic, we make observations. We have people that come in with something new and different and unusual, or something maybe that's very, very common. And then, and then the research world gives us an opportunity to study it, 
to quantify it, to explain why it happens that way, the mechanisms. And then we can take that information and go back and modify our clinical treatments. So I, I just heard a very interesting talk right before I walked in here uh, on, on uh, a study done in Taiwan about sleep. And, and anybody who works in tinnitus knows that sleep uh, is a in very important factor. Uh, if you're not sleeping well, your tinnitus is going to really affect you. Actually, life is going to affect you. And there's so many people with sleep disorders. Uh, in the clinic, we, we see that, that the vast majority of, of our patients say that sleep profoundly affects the loudness of their tinnitus. So I was very interested to hear the study about combining the EEG and, and the respiratory patterns and uh, even leg movement and the, the, how well these people were sleeping compared to the severity of their tinnitus. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we need to learn from our sleep experts. Uh, most people say that when they wake up is when their tinnitus is the loudest. A few people, it's the opposite. I'm really curious as to why. What is it? What's going on in the brain in that, that moment before we wake up that changes the pattern of, of neural firing in the brain that can affect tinnitus so profoundly? I think if we could find those answers, we might be able to, to develop more effective interventions. For the coming decade, that's what the big question everybody asks. Well, uh, first of all, I'm encouraged and optimistic. You know, I've been doing this since 1986. I come to this meeting, I learn something new every day. Uh, there's absolutely spectacular, dedicated people that, that have, have set aside significant parts of their career to focus on dealing with tinnitus and sound tolerance disorders. And um, uh, that was the first part. I don't think that, that even the field had much credibility uh, 10, 20 years ago. Nobody cared. No. And, and there was certainly no future in it as a scientist because you weren't going to get grants to do it. So I think there's, there's more research money uh, flowing to the laboratories, higher quality people than ever before. Uh, there are a lot a lot of ideas coming out. A lot of we generated a lot of hypotheses. What could be happening? And you have to do that. But then you you've got to systematically evaluate each of these hypotheses in a very rigorous way. And that's the difficult thing with tinnitus is there's so many constraints. Um, how long you've had it? Uh, whether it really truly is in one ear or both ears? Uh, what are the factors that caused it? All these things uh, affect the type of study that you do. Uh, but those studies are being done. They're being done in terms of, of types of medications that change brain function. They're being done in, in terms of electrical stimulation of the brain, of different regions of the brain, uh, and, and patterns and combining electrical stimulation and acoustic stimulation. So some very exciting things. Nothing has exploded yet that says, listen, I'm it. Um, and I, I don't really think that that's ever going to happen, that we're going to find one thing that wipes out tinnitus. But if we can find worthy interventions that can affect subgroups of people that have tinnitus, that would be a, a tremendous, a tremendous achievement. And I, I'm hoping that in this next decade, we're going to see things like that.